Good morning and welcome to worship. So glad you're here today, whether you're online or in person. We have some announcements as and most importantly, next Sunday night is our ice cream social. There are some flyers in the back as well, but I challenge you to take this one and hand it to someone to invite them. Um, we're having a reggae band, Cool Roots. And if, Kathy, did you want to say anything about that or? No? <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for um, procuring that. And we will have ice cream and desserts. There is a sign up in the back on the window there if you'd like to sign up, just so we have an idea. You don't have to. If you show up, I'll be so grateful. <laughs> and please bring someone again. And um, then we have our barbecue still set outside on September 12th. That's more of a church thing. This one is to invite others and in the community. And Wednesday at 10, I'll be meeting if you would like to come and help hand out flyers. I have them separated. They're in uh, um, piles already in rubber bands with the the num like odds on Garfield Street or even. So there's about 30 to 40 in each pile. If you want to take a pile today and just mark down on the ice cream social thing what you took, that would be great, or let me know if you can't be here. Or you can just wait till Wednesday at 10 or Thursday at 7, we'll do it again. So I need eight people to help do that. I'm taking a pile to there were nine, and that's just focusing on this area. And then we're putting some ads out on social media and such and letting the neighborhood association know, inviting our gardeners. So we hope to have a nice crowd. And again, we'll socially distance in the parking lot or on the grass near the annex. So we should stay safe. And please, if you're going to help serve, we do need helpers to serve. Please mark that down as well. The team is going to meet Wednesday night. Is there any other announcements? And NOAC is online coming up Labor Day weekend. If you have not registered and you would like to, please see the link um, or look it up on the website. I did email that out. There are birthdays, and we're going to start a new tradition of having people stand up. And since we haven't yet in August, we have Karen J. Pad's not here, and then the Sayers and the Royers are not here as well. But Dale's birthday is a few days, and summer is going to turn two, <laughs> I think. But if Karen and Jay can stand up, we will sing happy birthday to them. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God loves you, happy birthday to you. And then we have anniversaries this month, Alan, Kathy, how many years, Kathy? 49. Ooh, next year is a big one. Congratulations. Dale and Phyllis's is tomorrow, I see. And Emily and Tanner are this week as well. Or next week, next Sunday. On our ice cream social day. <laughs> so happy anniversary to all. Now we will prepare. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, there's Phyllis and Dale. Phyllis and Dale, you have an anniversary tomorrow. Happy anniversary, Happy anniversary we were just saying. How many years? <laughs> Did you stop counting? Congratulations. And happy birthday, Dale. We sang happy birthday. Did you hear us on the way up? <laughs> that was for you, too. <laughs> All right, let's prepare our hearts for worship.
for the call to worship and remain standing for the hymn and opening prayer. From darkness and despair, from being lost and lonely, God calls us home. Even though we have been selfish and let God down, we are still called beloved. We have been given a ministry of reconciliation and sharing. God reconciled us to God's self through the goodness of Jesus Christ. So we are now ambassadors for Christ. God is making God's appeal to all humankind through us in all that we say, think, and do. Praise be to God, who has placed God's trust in us. We will strive to serve God faithfully. Amen. Now let us sing praise, I will praise you, Lord, number 76. for the salvation of every person in every nation on earth. May your spirit deepen my anguish over those lost in darkness. Help us to reach those who yet, yet to know you and show us ways to point to you as the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. You may be seated.
what, what is this about? It's a practice we observe that shows humility and symbolizes communion with each other and God. What do you mean a practice? Is that all of them? No, there are others. There are some I like to call resurrection practices that we show by our actions, like forgiveness, hospitality, and love. There is also one we don't talk about much. It is called evangelism. What? Okay, no. I draw the line in standing on a street corner yelling or threatening hell to people I don't even know. Well, how do we do that if we don't stand on a street corner? There are many ways. We will look at some of the issues regarding true evangelism over the next couple of months. So stay tuned to our mini saga. Come be, come see. What does that mean? Come be what? Come see what? Okay, I'll stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you. If you can grab the bins, thank you. Thank you. So we'll be doing um, two of those skits every month, and one more will be next week, just so we can get two in this month. Does anybody have any prayer concerns or joys to lift up to the people today? Harry, would you bring Judy a microphone, please? Okay, she's going to come up here. I just wanted to announce that uh, prayers aren't always answered the way we Although sometimes it is that uh, my brother has passed as of yesterday. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, he will, will be two weeks from today. Thank you, Judy. I was so glad to hear that she went to visit him just the day before or a couple days before he passed. That's great. I'm sorry, though. It's clicker. <laughs> time to try a new one. Sorry. The, yes. The last time we were in church, I shared that I was having a test done the next Tuesday. Well, that, I think that was three weeks ago, because that test on that Tuesday didn't happen. It doesn't matter. It didn't happen for many reasons. It did happen this last Tuesday. Uh, got the results or saw the doctor on Thursday. Um, the scan was positive. It showed one paraganglioma, um, only one, which is a positive thing, very good thing. Uh, the location is not so good. It's in my, it's in my neck, surrounding or around or my carotid in mm. other areas there. Um, so they said he had talked to several of his friends, other doctors, and they say Mayo. So on Friday, they transferred all my information up to Mayo, and now we're waiting for them to respond to us for when we go up there to start whatever process it's going to be. So. That's all I know. Thank you. We will so keep you in your our prayers. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and Nancy wants me to say that normally this one is not. He doesn't think it's going to be cancerous. Uh, 
Okay. Because it was single and where it's at and everything. So we okay. don't know about the hereditary yet. He doesn't think that either, but I'm sure tests will be done on that. So. Mayo is a good place to be, I'm for sure, for that. Good. Anyone else? Please keep John Janet in your prayers. Please keep Lois Marie in your prayers as she moved to a nursing home for good now, and we sure will miss her. Kay? Yes, I. it's my hearing and everything, but Judy, I did not get your message. Could you please repeat it so I can understand? Yes. <laughs> um, Larry, her brother, passed away. And we were hoping that he was going to be moved here, but he was put on hospice care and his kidneys have shut down and now he passed away, her brother. So yeah, please keep Judy and the whole family in your prayers at this time. We're also praying for Megan, Daylene's niece, um, with the breast cancer. All the tragedies that have we have been um, focusing on with other people in our church family, please keep them all in your prayers still. Haiti really needs our prayers. Um, they had so much to deal with again. And now we have another storm headed towards the northeast. Keep that in your prayers. That's probably happening right now. It was downgraded to a tropical storm, I heard. But And this week, I forgot. I knew it in my head, and now I forgot. We are praying for the Garden City Church and First Central Church in our district, where Pastor Sonia Griffith is. Let us bow our heads. Oh, Heavenly Creator, we have much to worry about in these days. Help calm our fears and grace us with your presence when we are suffering. Be with the people in Afghanistan, suffering now also. Allow ways for peace to prevail somehow, some way, Lord. Allow us to stay focused on your grace and pray for it to be revealed. Open our eyes to see it in action in the world and allow it to bring more people to your precious son, Jesus, so they can be blessed and know the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus that he can be a help to them in this life and an advocate in the next. We praise you for being able to worship here today. Please be with us as we continue to battle COVID, Lord. Give us wisdom, give us strength, and give us peace, we pray. Amen. Now we will sing after the good news. Sorry. We have good good news for us. I'm going to take this down. I will be reading from Yeah. I will be reading from Acts 11. God has broken through. The news travels, traveled fast, and in no time the leaders and friends back in Jerusalem heard about it, heard that the non-Jewish outsiders were now in. When Peter got back to Jerusalem, some of his old associates, concerned about circumcision, called him on the carpet. What do you think you're doing rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what is prohibited and ruining our good name? So Peter, started, starting from the beginning, laid it out for them step by step. Recently, I was in the town of Joppa praying. I fell into a trance and saw a vision, something like a huge blanket lowered by ropes at its four corners came down out of heaven and settled on the ground in front of me. Milling around on the blanket were farm animals, wild animals, reptiles, birds, you name it, it was there. Fascinated, I took it all in. Then I heard a voice. Go to it, Peter, kill and eat. I said, oh no, master, I've never so much as tasted food that wasn't kosher. The voice spoke again. 
If God said it's okay, it's okay. This happened three times, and then the blanket was pulled back into the sky. Just then, three men showed up at the house where I was staying, sent from Caesarea to get me. The spirit told me to go with them, no questions asked. So I went with them, I and six friends, to the man who had sent for me. He told us how he had seen an angel right in his own house, real as his next door neighbor, saying, send, it, send to Joppa and get Simon, the one they call Peter. He'll tell you something that will save your life. In fact, you and everyone you care for. So I started in, talking. Before I'd spoken half a dozen sen sentences, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he did on us the first time. I remembered Jesus' words. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, if God gave the same exact gift to them as to us when we believed in the Master Jesus Christ, how could I object to God? Hearing it all laid out like that, they quieted down. And then as it sank in, they started praising God. It's really happened. God has broken through to the other nations, opened them up to life. Those who had been scattered by the persecution triggered by Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, but they were still only speaking and dealing with their fellow Jews. Then some of the men from Cyprus and Cyrene who had come to Antioch started talking to Greeks, giving them the message of the Master Jesus. God was pleased with what they were doing and put his stamp of approval on it. Quite a number of the Greeks believed and turned to the Master. When the church in Jerusalem got wind of this, they sent Barnabas to Antioch to check on things. As soon as he arrived, he saw that God was behind and in all. He threw himself in with them, got behind them, urging them to stay with it the rest of their lives. He was a good man that way, enthusiastic and confident in the Holy Spirit's ways. The community grew large and strong in the Master. Then Barnabas, Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. He found him and brought him back to Antioch. They were there a whole year, meeting with the church and teaching a lot of people. It was in Antioch that the disciples were for the first time called Christians. It was about this same time that some prophets came to Antioch from Jerusalem. One of them, named Agabus, stood up one day and, prompted by the Spirit, warned that a severe famine was about to devastate the country. The famine eventually came during the rule of Claudius. So the disciples decided that each of them would send whatever they could to their fellow Christians in Judea to help out. They sent Barnabas and Saul to deliver the collection to the leaders in Jerusalem. Thank you. And now we will sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Sorry.
Thank you all who participate in today's worship. Today's message is all about how we as believers need to be praying for new believers, for those yet to have a relationship with Jesus, to truly know his grace and love. And who can new believers be? Well, let's spend a few minutes discussing this first, and then we'll talk how it relates to the text. We could think of new or non-believers as anyone who is not yet a Christian, and boy, there are a lot of them in the world, over 5.4 billion of them out of the 7.9 billion on earth. This is without us even delving into different walks of Christians, beliefs, or whether someone is truly a follower of Jesus. But besides those who claim to be Christian, there are agnostics, those who question that there is a God, atheists, those who believe there is none, and other religions. There are still those who never heard the gospel, believe it or not. And there are those who worship Satan, which, by the way, I read is about 1.5% of the U.S. population, which is over 4 million people and about 10 million worldwide. I'm having trouble with this today. But now let's look at some stats from the U.S. Per the 2014 Religious Landscape Study found on the Pew Research site, about 70% of Americans identify as Christian, and 75% here in Nebraska, by the way. Now this pie graph is a bit older, from 2007, so the numbers have shifted a bit. But you see the blue being Protestant and the orange being Catholic make up about 75%. So nationally, we went down in those seven years about five percentage points. And 15% of Americans say they have no religion, up from 12% in 2007 here in the green. And then there's other faiths, about 8% in 2014, and would be a couple of the pieces of the pie over there and atheists and agnostics at about 3 and 4%. And let's briefly look at religions worldwide. This pie chart is a bit earlier than the data found from 2015 here, but notice Christianity is still the largest religion in the world, with almost a third of all people. Then comes Muslim, Hinduism, Buddhism, and other religions, like the Yazidis, religion, of which we have about 3,000 refugees here in Lincoln from, that are Yazidis. Me and Ziggy were talking about this at coffee time. And interestingly enough, I heard a speaker tell about this culture and religion at a Rotary Club meeting Friday. They've been persecuted and have had many genocides over centuries as their faith is considered heretical by ISIS and other fundamentalist groups. And they come from where our text is now in Acts, actually. So this other religion's piece seems to have declined from 12 to 8% notice. But what has happened to the religious nuns, the atheists and agnostics of the world? They've increased from 14 to 16%. And when we're talking about close to 8 billion people worldwide, that's about 160 million more. According to U.S. Census data, the nun group has finally started stagnating now, but alarmingly, young people from ages 18 to 29 identify as having religion 36% of the time, and only a little over half identify as Christian. Well, enough statistics for you. And yes, I know statistics are not perfect and can be used to support many's opinions, but they just fascinate me. But what's important is that we look at the trends of the statistics. So what do the trends tell us? I know some like to blame the next generation, but maybe we need to look humbly at our, our, ourselves that we're not what we're not doing or what we are doing to contribute to the decline in the church. Maybe we're not doing a very good job of evangelizing or discipling new generations or being the hands and feet of God in the world, pointing to him. Or we could be being hypocritical in some way, maybe too stuck, too cliquish. 
or not really believing in the power of God to reach those who have turned away from him, or those living in a way that dishonors God even. Now I want to share, I I was going to share the whole chapter of Acts, but I asked Judy to do that from the message, as it seems to be an easier way to listen to such a long section. But I hope that you have or will go home and read it in your own interpretation or translation today, or if you have. But Pastor Paul Labuter of Calvary Church in Ontario, Oregon, had some great insights on this chapter of Acts. First, Peter is retelling the story, right, of what we studied two weeks ago in his vision and of Cornelius to his old friends in Jerusalem. In the NRSV, verse 2, it calls these people the circumcised believers. And in the message that Judy read from, it said they were concerned about circumcision. These are new believers in Jesus, but they're Messianic Jews. Those who came to believe in Jesus, but still think in a legalistic way. God is doing a new thing and slowly revealing it to the Jews. First, there were Samaritans, whom were like half Jews to them, being let into the fold. Then there were the eunuch and Cornelius, both Gentiles who sought after God. And now even pagans in Antioch were about to be let in. He says we're seeing the development of thought that Paul writes about in Romans 3 later, in verses 20 to 22, that we are righteous before God even when we feel condemned due to what Jesus did for us. Our righteousness is based on grace through faith instead of works or by keeping the law. Instead of being happy about new believers coming to Christ, these people are upset that Peter went into the house of Cornelius. And this idea wasn't even biblical. It came from customs and rabbinic teaching. So we need to be careful that beliefs don't stem from what someone else says or tradition but is based on revelation and the word of God. Now I agree with Pastor Paul that there are four things we can learn from how Peter responded to these criticizing what he did. And we can remember these things if someone feels that we're doing something God doesn't say, but we know God's calling us to believe that way or do something. First, he responded with an attitude of humility. He didn't take it personal or get upset. He didn't say, who are you to question me? Jesus called me the rock. I was at the transfiguration by his side for years. No, he reacted calmly and gently, even though they didn't deserve it. Secondly, he responded with evidence. He shared what happened retelling the story where evidence led to his actions. It's a lot like when there's a court case and evidence is given to the judge or jury. It's based on circumstances, not not opinions or emotion. And it should cause them to come to a conclusion. This can relate to us talking to agnostics or atheists today, I believe. We shouldn't get emotional. We should state why and how we came to the decisions of belief. And we provide testimony to show that it's more than just a feeling, like how Jesus has helped us in the past, or prayer changed our situation. Peter adds a detail here in verse 12 that brings us to the third way Peter responds to the Jews. He says he and six men went into Cornelius' house. So now it's not just his word, against others. There are witnesses, another thing needed in court, right? And witness testimony was very important to the Jewish culture. And here it shows that with others, he applied wisdom. And then notice in verse 14, Cornelius wasn't saved alone. His whole household was saved. And it says the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it did on the apostles. And then he states the obvious conclusion that if it was surely of God, 
Who was he to stand in his way? He's saying, if you have a problem with this, then you have a problem with God. Take it up with him. These are smart debate tactics Peter is using for sure. And then he pertains it to scripture. In verse 16, he says, I remembered the word of the Lord, that John would baptize with water and you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. These are the same words said by Jesus in Acts 1. Everything we say or do, how we live our lives, should be backed up by the word of God. And if it's not there, then we should cycle back and respond with humility. That's what Pastor Paul says, and I agree. And if we're basing our thoughts and actions and our theology on God's word, then we don't have to elevate our opinion. It can be the last word. And what was the response in verse 18? They were silent. Sorry. They had nothing else to say, which reminds me of when Jesus said, you, you who have no sin cast the first stone. And the religious people went away quiet without throwing a single stone. Peter didn't need to keep arguing. He based his actions on God's word and revelation. And I just love the last part of verse 18 as they proclaim that new revelation, that God had given the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. That's the beauty that we're praying for when we pray for new believers. And so now this revelation is going to be put to the test as rebels and people not even searching for God are about to hear the good news and turn to Jesus. Antioch is a bustling city of com commerce, the third largest after Rome and Alexandria during the time. And like most big cities, there was lots of sinful behavior. And many kids would say today they're living like YOLO, you only live once. Or they're even practicing pagan religions, even with weird sexual rituals and such. And the text says most of the people were still just preaching to the Jews in Antioch. But then some men from, came from Cyprus and Cyrene and preached the good news to the Hellenists, who are the Greek Gentiles. Now here's Cyprus, the island in the Mediterranean, and Cyrene is down here west to the Egypt. You, you can't really see it on the map, but it's down next to Egypt on the left, and what's now Libya. And we don't know who they are or how they heard of Jesus. But we know Saul was still up in Tarsus to the north of Cyprus, the island. Could word have gotten out to, about Paul's teaching? You know, he was there seven to ten years, by the way, since his conversion on the road to Damascus. And we will see in verse 21, the hand of the Lord is with these mystery men, and a great many more people come to believe. And then the Jews in Jerusalem, like 300 miles south, send Barnabas to check it out. The same Barnabas that encouraged others to give in Acts 4 and came to stick up for Paul or Saul in Acts 8. And Barnabas saw God was on the move again. In verse 23, he says, it says, He saw the grace of God and was glad. He was surely meant to be there to spur these new Christians to stay in their faith. Can you imagine being in this group of Christians, these new Christians that had been living not in the ways of God for so long, hundreds of them, what would you say to them? Well, we need to be on the lookout for that grace. I've seen it in my jail ministry, I've shared with you, and other times where I was just jaw-dropped in awe of the grace of God showing up. So are you looking for it in others? Are you ready to be an encourager when you see it and welcome people in that you may not feel comfortable with right away? Those with different backgrounds, values, identities, or what you're used to, who you're used to seeing show up at church? I challenge you to be on the lookout for it because God is always in action. Sometimes we're just too blindsided or distracted, I think, to notice, to call it out and praise God with someone who's being shown that grace, to pray for and pe with people in desperation, 
to share the good news of Jesus and what he can do for someone. Now I'm going to share a story of a man I went to seminary with. His name's Tom Apple. I met him in about 2013, and he was about to graduate. He was marrying and heading off to where he felt called to be a missionary in France. He wanted people to hear there with fresh ears about this, not just the story of Jesus, but how a relationship with Jesus could be life-giving for them. Well, now Tom has three little boys, you can see here, and I read his newsletter from now time to time. And just last weekend, I got a prayer request about a barbecue he was going to be having with about 40 people from the community at his house. This is besides his house church, and many were invited by them. But they're non-believers, agnostics, atheists, even some Satan worshipers, he told us in his email. He asked that we pray that his message and music would be of interest to them, to want to get to know more about Jesus. And the next day, we got an update with some pictures about how it went. And a few people did seem curious, and he was thankful for our prayers. And now I ask you to pray for this group to get to know Jesus as a result of Tom's message, to continue to pray for Tom and his wife in Europe, and the other missionaries around the world trying to reach people for Jesus. And these are some pictures in the email he sent. There's his backyard preaching on the hill, and then eating and playing with them. And this is exciting to me, and I think we should be praying that things like this happen here in our lives and in our churches. And so I want you to think of someone that you know needs to get to know Christ, specifically someone who either says they're not a, they are a Christian but doesn't know what it means to walk with Jesus, or they're an atheist or agnostic, someone you personally know. And pray for that mer- person. Pray for that person this whole month, I challenge you. Pray for a few people even, and see God act. Now back to Pastor Paul of Calvary Church. Oh, that's not it. I'm sorry. And a quote. Oh, it is. Oh, that, yeah. Okay, so this is a quote from Walter Elwell, and I'm not sure who it is. He didn't even know who it was. I didn't look it up, but I love this quote about grace. Grace is the dimension of divine activity that enables God to confront human indifference and rebellion with an inexhaustible capacity to forgive and bless. This is what Barnabas saw. He saw that grace come upon people that would surely question, they would question, they weren't churchgoers, so people would question their ability to be changed. They lived in rebellion, and yet now they had come to Christ and were walking in forgiveness and newness of life, and he was delighted. If you find this kind of grace given to someone, it can energize a person or even a church. And we need to be a sign of that grace. People need to see that we know we are forgiven and blessed, even though we mess up. That we know he will never leave us or forsake us, and that it blesses us. They need to see that this is not a license to sin, but it allows us to be free, and Christ is allowing us to continually grow. And then what do we see at the end of this chapter? Therefore, they're foretold of a horrible worldwide famine that would occur. And these new believers decide God must have told them this for a reason. And not just to prepare for themselves, but to bless their fellow Christians. So they took up an offering and sent money back to Jerusalem, back to the believers there that were probably questioning their identity as Christians, as part of the flock. And this place, if you notice, Antioch was the first time followers of Christ were called Christians. And what did these new Christians do? Many new to the faith altogether. They turn around and give a blessing. 
and these Jews are surprised. Missing my last page, sorry. Even despite the reluctance to let them in, they are blessed by them. So pray for new believers. That's the gist of this message. And lastly, this last section is a reminder to give to our brothers and sisters in need. Which reminds me of Haiti at this time. As we've seen, they've been ravaged by another earthquake and then a storm and are in desperate need of our help. Our denomination has suggested an offering for them to be sent if you have not seen it, or you would like to give, feel free to mark it on your offering and Jay will be able to put it on your giving report and send it to the Emergency Disaster Fund of the Church of the Brethren to help our brothers and sisters in Christ in Haiti. And now we will sing our final hymn, Gracious Spirit Dwell With Me, number 507, verses 1 through 4. Now I pray that God allows the Spirit to inspire us to share the good news and pray for new believers. <laughs> 